Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to Evening Devotion. Just a heads up, my or, or the video might get interrupted by a phone call. I don't know yet. <clears throat> Lots of stuff going on today. I've been running all afternoon. Uh, just got home maybe 15 minutes ago. Probably going to have to head out again here in a little bit. Uh, I think they're going to let my mom out of the hospital, but she's going to be on oxygen. And I told her, probably going to put you on oxygen, just to let you know. Now the reality has set in. And she's having a hard time, even at 71, having a hard time accepting that um, she's getting older and her health is getting worse because that's what's supposed to happen. <laughs> so we've been having a lot of back and forth talking about it and trying to help her understand, you know, it's just the way, this is the way it is. My turn's coming. <laughs> Part of it's already here. So it is what it is. Um, but I'm going to hurry up and try to get this done. Not to take away from it, but to be proactive and get it done because I know I'm going to have to leave at some point in the next, I don't know how long. All right. Philippians 127 is our target verse tonight. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. This is a big verse. The whole verse says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Live in a way that glorifies God. You guys wonder where I got that from? Now you know. This and a few other verses. So, so that whatever I come and see, sees with his eyes, see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. I kid you not, and because I've, I've pictured this before in my head. If Paul was here now and got to travel to every country to talk to the church, he'd go upside most of our, us, our head. Literally. Smack us and say, what's the matter with you? What's wrong with you? You say you're a Christian and this is how you act? And he would be justified in doing so. Because much of what's going on now was happening back then, but it's worse now. But he would be very disappointed. I think all of the apostles would be very disappointed as at the state of the church today. This is why it's so important for those of us who are waking up, those of us who are seeing the truth, that we do what the Bible tells us to do, that we follow along with what we were told by the apostles, who are the authority, and Jesus Christ, who gave them their commission. Paul makes it perfectly clear. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So how should we act in public? How do you see most people with crosses around their neck act? Watch some police body cam videos and you'll see shocking things. They wear a cross and then act the way they do and say the things that they say. How can you call yourself a believer? That's not the proper attitude or the proper behavior of a born again believer, of a child of God. I think there needs to be a lot more conviction today, but that's just me. Okay, so let's go up here. One, two, three, four, five. We're going to start in verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. So he doesn't know what his future holds. He doesn't know where he's going to go. He doesn't know what fruit he's going to bear because it is the Lord bearing the fruit through him. The same thing with us. I've told you guys this. Verse 23, for I am hard pressed between the two having a desire to depart and be with Christ, amen, I think most of us are in that boat, which is far better. And I heard a pastor one time say, I don't know why anybody would want to die and leave the earth. Well, because to be with Christ is far better than to, being here, than to be here. That's why. I would be perfectly content leaving this earth and going to be with the Lord, even if it was right now, if he showed up and said, hey, even with everything I have going on, hey, it's time to go. But I'll give you a choice. Lord, you have to be first in my life. For me to go with you, not only is better because it glorifies you, better because it's better than what's here, but it's better for those I leave behind. Because I go on to be with you. And it may be that my departure causes them to believe in more and strengthens their faith. Sometimes we don't realize it, but we can be in the way of somebody believing. And when the Lord takes us, that's when they believe. Many people have prayed and prayed all their lives for their children and their grandchildren. When they die, they believe after that. Happens. Sometimes we never see the fruit from our labor. But what Paul's talking about here, if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. He doesn't know what fruit he's going to bear. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. 
Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. So to stay here and to work here is to is better for others. So that's what we'll do. If the Lord sees fit to take us, we go. If the Lord sees fit to leave us, we, we stay. Either way, we still glorify him. Verse 25, and being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Perfect. Amazing. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation, and that from God. This is one of the proofs that we're walking with the Lord. Persecution. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Read this again. Listen closely. For to you it has been granted, it has been gifted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him. It's a gift. That faith is given to us. It's a gift, not of us. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Not of yourselves but also to suffer for his sake. Our trials and tribulations at the hands of others because we believe in Christ, and it, it can be individually and it can be worldwide. Right now, a lot of us are getting it from the worldwide view because they're trying to ban Christianity. They're trying to attack us. They're making fun of us. They're tracking us, planning evil deeds on our behalf. That's all persecution, even if we don't know about it. But it, and it's for Christ's sake. So this is part of being a believer. These things are part of the walk of faith. Having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. Powerful stuff, Paul said. Book of Philippians is a really hard book, a really hard study, because it takes you a lot of different directions. The word conversation does not merely mean our talk and converse with one another, but the whole course of our life and behavior in this world. Bingo. Exactly what I told you guys. Live in a way that's glorifying to the Lord. And you can do that in every aspect of your life. What, what were some of the examples I gave you? Do the speed limit. Obey the laws of the road. Obey the laws of the land. Do things in a way that coincide with the laws of your municipality, of your location. That's a godly way to live. A lot of people don't realize that. The Lord said, follow the laws of the land. When they tell you to do something that goes in between you and the Lord, that's when you say no. Because it's unreasonable. Live a life that's glorifying to him, the whole course of our life and behavior in the world. The Greek word signifies the actions and the privileges of citizenship, and thus we are commanded to let our actions as citizens of the new Jerusalem, that's you and me, by the way, nobody else gets to go in that city but us, be such as becometh the gospel of Christ. What sort of conversation is this? In the first place, the gospel is very simple. So Christians should be simple and plain in their habits. What acronym have I taught you guys? Keep it simple, stupid. And many of you have come back and said, you know what? I finally understand what you, what you were saying because I've started to do that and it is a game changer. Exactly. Especially in life and especially as you read and understand the word. Keep it simple, stupid. Don't overcomplicate things. Don't overthink things. Right now, my mother, she's overthinking a lot of things with these changes coming up in her life. And I've told her, don't overthink it. Relax. Don't worry about nothing else. Just, just deal with what's right in front of us. We'll, we'll work on that later. In the military, we have a thing where you, you go on what you know and adjust fire later as necessary. And that's what we're going to do. Don't overthink it. Uh, so Christians should be simple and plain in their habits. Don't make it elaborate. Just keep it simple. There should be about our manner, our speech, listen, our dress, our whole behavior, that simplicity, which is the very soul of beauty. A lot of people will go get that really nice car and they'll paint all kinds of colors on it and stripes and designs and metal flake and undercoats and all this stuff. And you know what's more beautiful than that is a, a nice pearl white Porsche 911 or a pearl white Subaru Outback. 
pearl white. Beautiful, clean, straightforward color. Simple. Doesn't have to be fancy. Doesn't have to be crazy. Simple. Simplicity is the very soul of beauty. The gospel is preeminently true. It is gold without dross, and the Christian's life will be lusterless and valueless without the jewel of truth. Truth being the key. The gospel is a very fearless gospel. It boldly proclaims the truth. Whether men like it or not, <laughs> I love that because I was about to say that until I read ahead. Whether men like it or not, whether the world likes it or not, the gospel boldly proclaims the truth. When we proclaim the gospel, we boldly proclaim the truth. We must be equally faithful and unflinching as the gospel. But the gospel is also very gentle. Mark this spirit in its founder. A bruised reed he will not break. Some professors are sharper than a thorn hedge. Such men are not like Jesus. Let us seek to win others by the gentleness of our words and acts. The gospel is very loving. Now, as a side note to that, what he just said, he, he's, he's exactly right, 100%. But there are times when we have to be sharp. There are times when we have to hurt somebody's feelings because they, that's what they need to wake them up. In the book of Proverbs, it says the wounds of a friend are better than the kisses of an enemy. And sometimes we have to be that way, but it's not all the time, like a lot of people are doing. Uh, the gospel is very loving. It is the message of the God of love to a lost and fallen race. Christ's last command to his disciples was, love one another. Oh, for more real, hearty union and love to all the saints. How funny, because as I was coming back from my mother's house earlier, I prayed that very thing. That's funny. I prayed that very, very thing. More love in our hearts. Oh, for more real hearty union and love to all the saints. For more tender compassion towards the souls of the worst and vilest of men. I, I literally prayed almost identically what he's saying. We must not forget that the gospel of Christ is holy. It never excuses sin. It pardons it. But only through an atonement. If our life is to resemble the gospel, we must shun not merely the grosser vices, but everything that would hinder our perfect conformity to Christ. That means any and every sin. A lot of people love to be a hypocrite and hate it when you call them out on that. But we must avoid that too, to, so that we're not a hypocrite. Because it's easy to do. We need to know who we are in Christ and understand our behavior and examine ourselves so that we don't walk in these ways, so that nobody can point a finger and go, hey, look what you're doing. What am I doing? <laughs> for his sake, for our own sakes, and for the sakes of others, we must strive day by day to let our conversation be in more accordance with the gospel. Hey, Osito, you coming to here too? Hmm? You coming to hear the, hear the devotion too? What's up, buddy? So, yeah, I mean, I agree with everything he said. Amazing. Perfect. Right on the money. The whole point of being born again is to be born as something else, as someone else. We're still the person. People still know who we are, but we're different. Now, it's a very funny irony to this is that when we are changed and have a new body, we're given a stone with a new name that only we will know. The... The Bible talks about how we will be known as we were, but we're going to be different. We're going to be radically different. So we're born again by the Spirit in this life. We're regenerated and redeemed into something else even more because and we don't know what that is yet. It says we're going to be like Christ, but we don't know what that is. We don't know what we shall be. We're going to be something else, but people will remember us for who we were. Is that not important for us to go, well, if they're going to remember me for who I am, I might need to watch my P's and Q's in this life and how I conduct myself with others. But they'll remember who we were. We're going to be different, but they'll remember us that way. Amazing. Incredible. I don't think we'll be that different, but it'll be enough that people will notice. I don't know. The Bible doesn't give us too many clues on that. So what should our conduct be as believers? And a lot of people, they hate evidence of salvation, but you can't get away from it from the scriptures. This devotion makes it evidently clear. If you are a born again believer, there will be evidence in your actions, in your speech, in your lifestyle, in your everyday walk. There will be changes. 
There has to be. There must be something different in a born-again believer. And I've had people come and, sh and sh just sling slurs at me and the most hateful words. There is no evidence of salvation. Nobody needs to show evidence of their salvation. The Bible could completely disagrees with you. And we've read it multiple times here recently. Completely disagrees. There must be something different about you. Because if you are the exact same person now as you were before you were saved, how do you even know you were saved? Because I, I believe what the Bible says. Do you? But are you responding to it? Are you performing it like the Lord told us to do? That's the problem. They're not doing that. And in their blindness, they don't realize there's nothing that separates them from the rest of the world. Just a title, a sticker on their shirt like you get at the events. It says, hello, my name is Christian. Or hello, I am a Christian. But nothing else about them sets them apart from anyone else. They are exactly the same as the rest of the world. That's not a born-again believer. That's a false professor. A born-again believer is so different that others can't help but say, yeah, there's something different about them. Like a couple of years ago, they were this way, and now they're, they're a completely different person. Even people close to you should start to notice the difference. It's happening to me. My family notices. Those around me notice. Even if they don't vocalize it, there's something, there has to be something different about you. That's the whole point of being born again. Born again as something brand new, something that's never existed before. And when we're changed, that will be revealed physically. You'll be able to visually tell that there's a difference. We just don't know what that is yet. But it should be evident now. People should be able to, like, you see somebody 10 years later after you're born again, and they've never seen you since. But, wow, you're different. You've really changed. They should be able to notice if you're truly a born-again believer. So evidence of salvation is key as to, as to markers to show us where we are. If we examine ourselves, shouldn't we see something different? And shouldn't it align with the word and what it says? Sure. Those people can't do that. That's why they don't read the Bible, because they know deep down, and you can pin them down on this, and they hate it. If they read the Bible, the Bible will convict them and tell them what you're doing is wrong. They don't want to give up those things. They don't want to give up their sin. So they don't read the scriptures. They only read the part they like. That's why if they do videos, you hear them repeat themselves with the same verses over and over again. They don't ever read any, any other parts of the Bible, because those parts convict them for their wrongdoing. If they would read them and, and address the conviction, the goads poking them in the heart, maybe they'd be saved. But the Lord is going to deal with all that when the time comes. The Lord is going to straighten all of that out. What we can do now, examine our lives. Am I doing the things in a, in a general fashion? Simple, keep it simple. That's the best. Am I going that direction that the Bible says I should be going? If not, I need to make adjustments. And that's what's great about the age of grace is we have time to make adjustments. I wouldn't take too much time, though, because we're in an age now, we're in a generation now where it seems like we're really close to everything changing. I wouldn't put off tomorrow what you can do today. Now, all of us that are here, we all know this. We've covered this multiple times over the years. We all know this. But there may be new people listening that haven't heard this before. That's what I love about these devotions is they come back and revisit these topics from different perspectives. If you have a problem with the term evidence of salvation, if you don't think there should be evidence of salvation, I challenge you to get into the scriptures and find it. Find where it says you should be the exact same person as you were before you got saved. Because I tell you this, before I got saved, I had no faith. After I got saved, I had faith. That's my first evidence. There's going to be something different. So if you don't have, if you have a problem with it, go to the Bible, prove it, prove that there should be no change. Because I can show you every single scripture that will show you are going to be changed. The whole New Testament is full of it. Example after example after example. Again, the thief on the cross. We can't get away from him. In what, two of the Gospels, three of the Gospels? He's mocking Jesus with the other guy. And one of them, all of a sudden, he got, he's like, wait a minute. We deserve to be here talking to the other thief. We did wrong. We're This is our just punishment. He did no wrong. He doesn't deserve to be here. Who do you think you are to mock him like that? Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That man was radically changed from, from just a few minutes' time. 
First, he mocked, then he dawned on him, wait a minute, what am I doing? He changed, and the evidence was clear. And Jesus responds, today you will be with me in paradise. And for all those people out there who are going, yeah, he just said paradise, that's down on the earth. Yeah, but Jesus went to the earth to go get those people and take them to heaven. Why do you think he said that? Jesus went down first, the thief followed behind. He probably got there when Jesus was talking to everybody. Jesus probably turned around and said, ah, you made it. Here's what you need to know. Let's go. And everybody took off and went to heaven with him. It's real simple. And I'm glad that it's simple. Otherwise, most of us probably wouldn't get it. I know I wouldn't. Simple is best. Do what the Lord said to do. Follow what this word tells us to do to the best of our ability. And some things we're not going to be able to do very well. It's okay. You don't have to do it perfect. It never was made for, made that way that you have to do it perfect. It is what it is. But we can do our best. And where we lack, the Lord takes up the slack. Where we fall short, the Lord ties stretches the line and ties it off. Where we stumble, he picks us up. Do it his way. His way is the best way always in every situation, no matter what. And in the end, we're all going to find out that that was the right way to go because the Lord told us that. But then he'll reiterate that point when we stand before him. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name, and I'll see you in the next video.